Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Jonathan Sobel. I'm the Tokyo Bureau Chief for the Financial Times, and I'll be your moderator today. The topic is the economy. Always an important subject for journalists covering Japan, but rarely more so than in the past year, with the return to power of the Liberal Democratic Party and Shinzo Abe, and the emergence of Abenomics. In the past 13 months or so, since the election that brought Mr. Abe to power at the end of 2012, the yen has fallen, the stock market has risen, deflation has gone into retreat, uh, if not been defeated. Their uh, prices are rising about 1% a year now, uh, a big deal in Japan, uh, and about halfway to the Bank of Japan's target. Growth last year was well above Japan's long-term average. In fact, in the first half, Japan grew faster than any economy in the group of seven. Uh, it's been rare since many of us have been in Japan, if, if not all of us, that, uh, that we can say that. Of course, there are challenges and uncertainties. Uh, we don't know if inflation will keep rising to the 2% target. We don't even know, frankly, if that's a good thing. <clears throat> The fiscal policy of Mr. Abe's first year, which has been highly expansionary, is about to shift into a more contractionary direction with the rise in the consumption tax in April. Wages have not kept pace with prices. That, I think, will be a big theme in 2014, which our panelists will address today. And of course, the supposed, uh, the so-called third arrow of Mr. Abe's Abenomics program, structural reforms, has disappointed many people. Uh, we are promised more details and more initiatives this year. So with us today to discuss these topics and give their outlook for 2014 for Japan and uh, to, I think, a smaller extent, uh, Asia in general, are three distinguished economists. Uh, to my, you'll excuse me for referring to my paper, I don't want to screw up their titles. To my immediate right is Masamichi Adachi. He's executive director and senior economist at JP Morgan. Beside him is Masayuki Kichikawa, who is chief economist at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And finally, Mr. Hiromichi Shirakawa, who is chief economist at Credit Suisse Securities Japan. Uh, what we'll do is we'll give each of them a chance to give uh, their, uh, a brief presentation then turn to your questions. Now, these are all economists working for Western investment banks in Tokyo. As such, there is a kind of filter, but we hope it's not, uh, it's not a sort of unanimous mold, and we'll try to tease out areas of uh, agreement as well as areas of difference. Uh, and we're looking forward to your pointed questions. It's the season of New Year's resolutions. I've got two for you. One is turn off your mobile phones. The other is keep your questions brief and to the point. Uh, the order of presentations will start at the far end of the table with Shirakawa-san, if that's OK. All right, thank you very much. All right, um, good afternoon and uh, Happy New Year to you. Um, probably I'll take um, seven to eight minutes uh, for my presentation. Um, I suppose you have your, um, in front of you, you have um, hard copies of my presentation, um, but we do not, I do not necessarily not go through that. So uh, just, just as in, you know, listening to, to me. Um, I'd like to make three points. Uh, firstly, in terms of the economic growth for 14, um, it may be better to talk about uh, in a fiscal year terms. Uh, we look for actually plus 1.8% on fiscal year 14, so remaining very close to 2%. So this ending fiscal year, we're going to see maybe 23 2.4% growth. Um, but many economists, uh, I tend to believe, expect the GDP growth to slow down to possibly like 1%. But we have been sticking to 1.8% uh, gross forecast. Uh, a few backgrounds. Number one, even though the VAT is being raised and fiscal policy is being tightened in that sense, uh, we tend to think that uh, expenditure policy of the government uh, is likely to remain fairly supportive for the economy. Uh, supplementary budget has been um, has been presented to the diet, and it should go through. 
And we tend to think that supplemental budget is, is you know, supporting GDP, roughly speaking, uh, 0.5. And also, we tend to think that, to some extent, it, it is up to the wage dynamics. But consumption tax hike impact on consumption will not be that huge, mainly because of the wealth effects uh, from a likely further rises in stock prices. So in that sense, the fiscal policy uh, related drag on the economy will be fairly limited. And second point, before, uh, as a background for the, our fairly optimistic you know, GDP forecast, the monetary policy will remain supportive for the economy. In our view, uh, you know, difference between the US and Japan in terms of the uh, monetary policy direction uh, is likely to lead to a um, weakening of the yen. And we actually forecast 120 uh, by the end of the year. That call is a bit too aggressive. Uh, in my personal opinion, but, uh, but I myself you know, tend to, to feel that yen could touch 115 uh, by autumn. So uh, that is pushing up the macro level corporate profits and bonuses of corporate workers will be pushed up and that will be supported for the economy. And third arrow uh, of abenomics uh, is likely to underpin uh, economic activities mainly through uh, infrastructure investment and exports of the uh, infrastructure related products such as uh, nuclear power plant related products and maybe transportation related. So in, in that sense, uh, we are very optimistic in, in the short run in terms of the economy. This is the first point. The second point is regarding the uh, sustainability in terms of the um, impact of aggressive money printing on GDP and inflation. Uh, we actually do not think that 2% inflation is achievable in two years' time if we exclude the VAT hike effects. And we continue to believe that Bank Japan is too optimistic about the inflation outlook. And we, we tend to think that if you exclude uh, impacts from the VAT hikes, uh, CPI would be probably from the coming, let's say, few years, between 0.5 and 1%. Or even excluding VAT hike, 0% is possible. So uh, we remain fairly you know, pessimistic about the outlook of inflation. This is the, the second point. And third point is on the uh, a lot of um, economics, structural policy, excluding the what I talked about, uh, you know, the uh, on the stimulus, sorry, demand stimulating type of you know the components of economics of third dollar. Uh, if you look at the structural policies uh, from the third dollar, we we tend to think that uh, um, impact on potential GDP remains uh, quite uncertain. And we do not think delegation measures are uh, satisfactory. And we tend to think that uh, the, uh, one of the biggest shortage of the SADA of abenomics is the, um, the there is little uh, you know, about the increase in immigration. So uh, our administration has been uh, too much um, you know, focusing on the you know, increasing the immigrants in terms of the uh, high-skilled labor, or too high-skilled labor. And uh, in, in, in my understanding, or in our understanding, government has been, uh, you know, underestimating a uh, possible, uh, you know, significant shortage of labor kind of problem into the future. And as you know, Japan is now suffering shortage of labor in terms of the construction, America a bit, services in general. And what we need is the um, um, you know, significant increase in uh, the non-Japanese workers from outside of Japan uh, with some skill, not a kind of professional, professional thing, maybe construction workers, medical and services. And in that sense, we need to see a more, I think, the uh, significant you know, the relaxing of the deleg uh, deduction of regulation uh, on immigration. So uh, that is uh, in shortage. 
And in that sense, we, we do not think potential GDP of Japan would, is unlikely to you know, take off from the current 0 percentage number. And if there's a case, Japan fiscal situation will be uh, remaining under significant pressure. And our worry right now relates to a, um, um, the seemingly structural deterioration of external balance. Uh, and today, again, we saw a an, you know, deficit in current account balance. And we, we tend to think that that may, may have reflected uh, the structural change in, in you know, external transactions of the country. So even under the depreciation of the currency, uh, real exports have not picked up much. In the meantime, real imports have been picking up. And the so-called terms of trade uh, have been all right, but because of the deterioration of the real balance of trade, uh, Japan is now suffering the uh, even you know, small deficit in the current account balance. So if that situation continues, and if energy policy of the government is unchanged, we're going to probably see a, um, a secular deficit of current account balance, maybe you know, by the end of next year. So already in you know, a three consecutive months of the you know, deficit, uh, but we, we tend to think that the consumption tax hike, uh, if it's not necessarily you know, uh, weakening consumption, by the end of next year, uh, this year, sorry, by, by the end of this year and maybe, maybe you know, our early part of next year, people tend to feel that, wow, this country's balance is already in deficit, even on a structural basis. That might lead to some pressure on interest rates and debt dynamics will become a very important point. And for that, we need to you know, push up potential GDP. But again, uh, labor market policy by the government doesn't seem to be that satisfactory. So we are very much worried about the medium term fiscal dynamics. Uh, I stop here. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. My name is Masa Kichikawa uh, from Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Um, I, I just prepared uh, some slides, so uh, I like to uh, talk uh, using these ones. Uh, the first page of my slide summarizes our growth forecast, and uh, this is based on the calendar year, so uh, a little bit different from what Shirakawa-san explained. But uh, uh, my forecast for growth rate uh, for, for fiscal, uh, 2014 is 2.0 for Japan. Uh, on fiscal year basis, uh, I expect 1.4%, so, uh, which is a little bit lower uh, than the Shirokasan's 1.8%. But uh, I think uh, our forecast of 1.4% for fiscal 2014 is based on our Forex forecast of 108, 108 yen per dollar at the end of this year. So uh, fundamentally, probably we are more optimistic than Shirokasan. Uh, fundamental forces would sustain Japan's growth, uh, even uh, in face of a higher consumer tax rate hike this year. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we th believe that uh, Japan should be able to get out deflation uh, from this year, as you can see in this table. Uh, even excluding uh, VAT tax effect, uh, we expect a 0.9% rise in core CPI index. So finally, Japan is getting out of deflation after more than 15 years of uh, kind of a very persistent, gentle deflationary uh, period. And so uh, I, I, what I want to uh, emphasize today is that uh, Japan is entering a completely different phase in terms of nominal growth rate. Uh, if we look, focus on real growth rate, Japan does not look very interesting still because of the very low potential growth rate uh, uh, reflecting uh, shrinkage of uh, labor uh, supply. Uh, but uh, the chart on the second slide in my uh, package uh, shows that uh, uh, Japan has been growing relatively well uh, in terms of real term, in real term. But uh, because of deflation, Japan has been suffering uh, negative growth uh, in nominal term. This means that uh, uh, in terms of money, uh, the size of the Japanese economy has been shrinking. Uh, probably we would be uh, finally end this, this kind of situation. So uh, uh, the, third, uh, the chart on the third slide uh, shows that uh, uh, I expect uh, more than 2% nominal growth for 2014 and 2015. We have never seen this kind of uh, uh, higher than 2% nominal growth rate for two years since 1980s. 
So uh, my view is that finally we are ending deflation and uh, we are normalizing the nominal growth rate rather than real growth rate. And that should have a very profound implication for financial market and the economy as a, uh, in general. That is what, about the point I would like to emphasize. And uh, I base uh, three factors. Uh, I, I base my optimistic uh, view on three factors. Uh, one is, uh, of course, uh, economic policy by the Abbey administration. Uh, here, I'm not very different from Shirakawa-san. Uh, supplementary budget would uh, support Japanese economy by probably 60 basis, 70 basis points. Uh, and offsetting the impact of higher consumer tax rate, which is estimated to be about 100 basis. Uh, so uh, I think uh, still, you know, uh, higher consumer tax rate would be a little bit uh, negative for Japanese economy, but uh, that would be mostly offset by the effect of supplementary budget. That is one factor. And uh, the second factor is a spillover of the dramatically improved profitability of the corporate sector. As you can see in the left-hand side panel uh, on page six, uh, uh, we have already seen a dramatic rise in corporate, corporate profitability uh, as a result of the normalization of foreign exchange rates. Uh, actually, many companies in Japan were struggling with excessively high foreign exchange rates until the end of 2012. But the, now the yen is uh, around uh, 103, 102, uh, this is almost in line with uh, macro fundamentals for Japan. So uh, uh, without cutting prices, uh, Japanese companies would be able to sell their products or services. That resulted in a dramatic rise in profitability. That has already taken place. Big question would be to what extent this kind of improvement in corporate profitability would spill over to wedges and uh, capex this year. That's a kind of a critical point. And uh, this is a point I'm, I'm led to be optimistic. First, uh, regarding uh, wage growth, uh, judging from the relationship between unemployment rate and, uh, and uh, scheduled cash earnings, this is a kind of a baseline wage portion of the power worker uh, cash earnings. And uh, we are approaching the point at which we should begin seeing some rise in uh, baseline wages. So uh, I think uh, I'm relatively optimistic about the uh, wedge negotiation round of, uh, of this spring. And uh, I expect uh, baseline wages to rise. And regarding CapEx, we have already begun seeing uh, some sign of life. And if we look at the core machinery orders, uh, since the second half of last year, we have already begun seeing some picking up, pick up. I think this will continue uh, as uh, corporate management people would become more confident that uh, this uh, change would be more sustained. This is the second point. And the third point is uh, uh, export. And this is a kind of point which divides Jacques and, and me, I think. Uh, uh, I think, I believe there is one year time lag between foreign exchange rates and export volume. And the chart on the page six, in, uh, page nine, I'm sorry, uh, in my chart deck, I showed that uh, uh, now our export volume has begun picking up uh, after one year uh, of the beginning of the weakening of currency. So uh, probably we are entering the positive part of the Jacob effect uh, from this year. So uh, effect of policy and the speed of better corporate probability and the positive portion of Jacob effect. So these are kind of three factors which makes me, which make me more optimistic uh, about Japan. And uh, regarding uh, inflation, deflation, uh, we have already begun seeing some uh, inflation, uh, not only because of the higher energy prices, but because of other factors. And uh, I think uh, uh, this time uh, we have finally ended the deflation because of two reasons. First, uh, we have turned around the currency. And second is uh, supply demand condition in Japan. And as Shirakawa-san touched upon, uh, we are very different from the US. Uh, we are facing a, a shrinking uh, working population. So it should be much easier for us to reduce the demand supply gap in the labor market. So uh, probably 2014 would be the year when the shrinking population would turn from deflationary factor into inflationary factor. So these two factors, reversal of the currency and, uh, the, and the change in the implication of shrinking working population would mean that uh, we have finally 
uh, getting out of, we are finally getting out of deflation. So, uh, uh, but still, uh, I, I, agree, I agree with Sheryl Kwasan in, in that uh, uh, inflation would not be reaching 2% inflation target by the BOJ. So, uh, I also believe that uh, there is a strong possibility that BOJ would consider uh, easing monetary policy again, probably in the first half of this year. And regarding uh, risk uh, factors, of course, there are various risks for Japan, uh, which is summarized on page 11. But uh, I put more uh, emphasis on the energy also. Uh, energy policy and energy prices would be the largest risk for Japan uh, for this year. On the other hand, the upside risk would be uh, one factor would be a more uh, portfolio rebalancing. Uh, reflecting the lower real interest rates. And we have already begun seeing some sign of change in the asset allocation by the household sector in Japan. As you can see in the right-hand side table on page 12, uh, as you can see in a circular area, uh, it, for the 12 months from October 2012 to September last year, uh, Japanese households increased their holding of mutual funds by 7.5 trillion yen, which is the largest since 2005 under the Mr. Koizumi. So uh, we have already begun some sign, see, seeing some sign of change of asset, of asset allocation by the household sector. This should uh, lead to a more uh, rising asset prices, and that would have a positive, that, that have positive factor uh, on the growth rate. Let me stop here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Masamichi Adachi. I'm a senior economist of JP Morgan. I was thinking to speak rather, you know, optimistic view on Japan, but uh, now after listening from these two gentlemen's uh, quite optimistic views, I have to be a little bit more cautious on that. Uh, Mr. Shirakawa, actually, he was my former boss in the BOJ <laughs> about 10 years ago, 20? Nearly 10 years Not ago. 20. Something. Not 20. <laughs> Not 20, but 10 years ago, uh, he said 1.8% for the uh, fiscal year 2014, and uh, Mr. Kichikawa told that 1.4. Uh, JP Morgan's official view is only 0.6. But 0.6 is not so bad for Japan as our uh, potential growth rate is 0.6. Therefore, it's not a recession, it's not the you know, end of the world, but still not so optimistic as these gentlemen are. And uh, as at the beginning, he, uh, Mr. <coughs> Sobo said, you know, we are working in an investment bank in, uh, from US and uh, Europe. So uh, we are a little bit biased to the uh, optimistic side of Japan. So I'm probably too naive on the uh, sort of stubborn cautiousness of the Japanese economy. But anyway, so well, 0.6, uh, how we see that? I mean, they talked about whole year, but I want to talk about from the sort of dynamics of the economy for through this year. We all know that the tax hike is coming in April. So that means that our economy will be like a roller coaster in the first half of the year. Before the tax hike, we are expecting a boom in the GDP, and after that, plant in the GDP. That's exactly what happened in 1997 when we got the tax hike from 3% uh, to the current 5%. And so the real test for Japan is actually coming in the second half of the year, uh, when the economy should rebound from the plant in the second quarter. <coughs> Uh, we are not so uh, optimistic on the private consumption in the after the uh, plant because, uh, as, as you know, that the, the CPI, I mean, inflation is now around 1%, and the tax hike is, you know, 5 to 8% makes the about 2% point hike in the in overall inflation. So if you combine these two, we are now expecting a 3% 3 3 point hike in the headline CPIs. And I do not think that Japanese corporate can increase their labor cost, meaning number of employees and wages up 3% like that. We are expecting maximum, say, 1.5, 1.8. Such kind of numbers we are probably can expect the you know, maximum. That means our, uh, our vocabulary, real income or real purchasing power of household will deteriorate, certainly deteriorate. So that means consumption should be uh, not so devastating week, but very uh, still sluggish in the second half of the year. So real test 
for Japan is how corporate sector can revive their spending behavior. In that sense, uh, we are not so uh, optimistic, as I said, on the wage side, but we are more optimistic on the capital expenditure side. So as uh, Mr. Kichikawa mentioned, you know, the capital goods, I mean, sorry, machinery orders are now already picking up, and we are hearing more and more positive story on the capital expenditure. So that's why uh, we think the uh, Japan can sort of overcome this uh, tax hike shock, uh, but uh, probably that's impact it is quite severely hit the household sector and corporate sector should encourage whole economy up. And, uh, and that's, in that regard, we need more support from government and uh, or more policy makers, including BOJ. Uh, we also believe, I mean, as same as uh, these two gentlemen, that we do not believe that 2% inflation is achievable in two years by the BOJ's policy. We think that it takes longer than that. I mean, people's inflation expectation doesn't change so rapidly. So that means BOJ has no way but to ease further. So that's why we're, expe we're now expecting a BOJ will act in April this year, and maybe uh, that makes the end rather remain weeks, but not 120, as Mr. Shirakawa predicted. We are probably expecting, uh, say, 105 to 110 level rather than uh, 120 level. And the uh, uh, second point I want to mention about uh, this, uh, you know, the strength of the Japanese corporate is we have to mention about the global economy. Uh, this title is including an Asian region, but I want to a little bit touch on the uh, global economy. Uh, our JP Morgan, as you may know, that we are an international, uh, international company and we are covering more than, uh, nearly 40 countries in the world to track the record, uh, track the monthly or weekly data. And we are now seeing that the economy is r rather picking up in, at the end of the la last year. So we are relatively optimistic on the uh, 2014 growth. However, it doesn't mean that we can go back to the uh, very strong recovery like uh, uh, the uh, expansionary phase between 2002 and 2007. Uh, between, uh, in our JP Morgan basis, between 2002 and 2007, the global economy was expanding on average 3.6%. Our, expect, our forecast for the 2014 and 15 is around 3%. So the pickup is okay, but not so strong. So that means exports for Japan is not so robust as many people probably would expect, but still picking up. So that's fine, but point is uh, probably we are in a new normal. Third point I want to highlight is that this related to this new normal. Uh, for Japan, you know, even though that we are relatively optimistic on the uh, growth in this year, it doesn't mean that we can overcome the huge challenges of the government debt and demographics. We have to overcome these real secular ch uh, challenges through the uh, more structural reforms and more change of the perception in society that we need to uh, make the sustainable path of global economy and fiscal and, of course, including social securities. I think that's, uh, that's uh, uh, why I'm more concerned on the, uh, how you call it? Uh, sorry, I, have, I always need to check. Complacency in the English, you know. The, uh, if the economy is doing quite well in this year, that probably makes the uh, policy makers more reluctant to go through the painful reforms. That's a real challenge for this country. But at the same time, I want to emphasize this is not only for Japan. All global economy is facing uh, real challenges to how to sustain the uh, debt dynamics, not only the fiscal, but the domestic uh, private sector in the emerging economies, and in the US case, how to manage to uh, spur the productivities. And you know, many people mention about the energy uh, revolution in the US, but uh, I think that part is not so significant enough to overcome the slowdown of the secular growth. Uh, JP Morgan is now expecting a potential growth rate is, uh, in the US is below 2%, lower than the uh, Fed or many policymakers want to achieve. So what I want to say is 2014, probably okay for Japan and global economy and even global financial market, but challenges will persist. I want to end this way. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh,
I'm glad that in spite of what Ajachi-san described as the bias towards bullishness uh, of investment bank economists, uh, we still had some variety in your forecast and in your views. I want to thank you for that. Um, I, before I turn over the questions to the floor, I'm going to use my prerogative as the, uh, as the MC to ask one. Uh, even though there is some divergence in your headline growth forecasts, uh, the most pessimistic among you, Adachi-san, is saying, yes. not a recession, not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, you deal in probabilities and in ranges in your forecast. I'd like to ask you, just to, in, the, in the theme of forecasting, uh, what do you think are the chances, percentage-wise, even though it's not your main scenario, mm -hmm. that we will see a repeat of 1997 with the consumption tax increase and that, that we will not only slow down but actually experience a recession. That is, I know that's n none of you are, are predicting that, but if you could sort of give us a, a sense of where the, the outlier is in, in, in your views. Um, we, can, we, we, we went from uh, the far end of the table <laughs> on the way in. Maybe we'll start with the yeah. close end of the table on the, on the way out now. Even though I'm, I don't say pessimistic, but I want to be cautious, but uh, you know, I only put the 20% chance that Japan get back to the uh, recession after the tax hike. That's very minor uh, probability. All right. Well, of course, uh, very similar, uh, 10 to 20 percent, and uh, probably uh, kind of a more weaker economy mm -hmm. become, would become likely when something uh, out, uh, out of control by the government would happen. And most likely risk factors uh, in this context would be uh, two things. One is, uh, of course, uh, unexpected uh, worsening of overseas economy, especially uh, I'm concerned with, uh, still a little bit with Europe. And another is uh, unexpected sharp rise in energy prices. All right. Yeah, I think um, maybe 10%. So um, recession risk is very small. Um, but I think the risk factor includes um, possible no change of policy by the BOJ leading to higher yen, uh, possibly 97, 98, uh, and also the risk of the um, possible significant slowdown of the Chinese economy. So uh, those two things, if it happens, um, growth rate could be much, much lower than our current expectation. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll, I'll start taking questions now, starting, uh, Anthony, please go ahead in a second. Yeah, if, uh, if someone could bring him a mic, or do you want to... Uh, do you actually, we have a mic up at the front, so if you come up and just uh, state your name and affiliation bef before your question, as usual. <laughs> yes, I'm not about to forget now. Um, Anthony Rowley, um, Singapore Business Times. Question really for Mr. Shirokawa. I think you said that if present trends continue, we could see a, a secular deficit on the current account by the end of next year. And you said, I think that this could have uh, in, uh, an impact on interest rates and on uh, debt dynamics. Can you just explain a little bit more how that would come about, the mechanics of that, and what the actual impact would be on Japan's external rate inference? Um, what kind of impact do you have in mind? And just very quickly, if I could ask the other everybody, if the yen remains at roughly this, this level, do you think there's any chance that Japanese companies could begin to bring production back onshore again? We've seen that Canon is going to do this. Just, what's the chances of this movement spreading, do you think? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the... Uh, we, we tend to think that uh, the uh, turn of the current account balance uh, into a deficit on a secular basis is a very symbolic uh, economic uh, phenomenon for the country, uh, which has been running surplus for a long, long time. And the you know, net um, or deficit in current account balance does mean that uh, Japan has to borrow money on net basis uh, from outside and country, uh, I think meaning that country, you know, is becoming a net uh, borrowing country rather than net uh, lending country. And we tend to think that uh, that would push up interest rates mainly because uh, almost by definition, the share of the foreign investors financing Japanese debt 
uh, you know, should be much, much higher than the current, situa current level. One, of course, hope is that the BOJ is taking care of that. But the risk is that if the external balance, uh, you know, getting into a deficit on structure basis and printing money, um, yen would receive under pressure uh, from money printing and uh, external balance deterioration. Expectation for, for, for the currency may change, and the capital may start to outflow. And BOJ's money printing would not necessarily work. So in, in, that, in that sense, you know, the uh, risk premium for JGB is to pick up, and interest rates rises, of course, you know, depending on the, you know, the magnitude, but leading to, of course, as you know, uh, increase in debt services, and increase in deficit, and you know, further print of JGBs. And if, you know, people start to look at uh, 230, 40% of GDP of public debt, and a confidence about Japan would start to deteriorate quite massively. Interestingly, I was in uh, Hong Kong and Singapore last week, and um, you know, I, I actually know, you know um, the was a bit confused by the Asian investors' view about Japan, even under the situation of picking up the stock prices. Uh, many investors uh, asked me about the sustainability of fiscal situation in Japan, even though not many you know, have talked about debt dynamics in Japan domestically. Uh, many you know, Asian investors are now worried about the uh, possible um, or you know, very limited impact from the VH hike on fiscal situation. So um, you know, we have seen a situation where not many talk about 230% of debt to GDP, but still the Asian clients are looking at that. Uh, on, on, on the second question, maybe you can answer. Yeah, and yeah. if you have anything well, to add on the yeah, first one, actually, please, you know, the, please go ahead. Uh, it is very one. difficult. In our view, yen's depreciation should, in theory, uh, promote more domestic production rather than um, you know, overseas production. But what we have found is that the overseas production-related profitability improves as well uh, under the yen's depreciation. So theoretically speaking, exports would become more attractive for companies, uh, exporters. But in the meantime, if they do have already subsidiaries-related overseas operation, that profitability also picks up under yen's depreciation. And there remains a gap in terms of profitability between overseas and domestic, uh, in terms of the you know, profit to sales ratio. And there is a there is a, uh, some decent gap in terms of that profitability, like six percent outside, four percent inside. And that gap, I mean, in absolute terms, would remain. So domestic profitability may pick up for from four to five, but overseas profitability may pick up from six to seven. In our calculation. So uh, we don't know. I think the yen's depreciation is not necessarily that that helpful for stopping uh, the so-called hurrying out. Yeah. Uh, regarding the second point, uh, as I stopped, touch, up, touched up on during my explanation, uh, the current level of foreign exchange rate is almost in line with macro fundamentals. So uh, I'm expecting only moderate uh, reversal of the overseas projection, pro production into domestic sites. Um, if uh, three, one of the three things happens, uh, we would see more visible uh, return uh, of production site into Japan. Uh, one is, of course, uh, more depreciation of currency, uh, say 125. Uh, second would be a more dramatic uh, corporate tax rate cut. Uh, which would raise uh, expected profitability uh, of the doing business inside Japan. And the third is more clear, uh, kind, of, kind of a reliable energy, long-term energy policy. I think uh, uncertainty about energy policy is creating a lot of uh, kind of uh, cautiousness on the side of the business sector. So uh, if government succeeds in removing uh, these concerns, probably that will stimulate uh, the domestic investment by the, by the companies. And regarding the possibility of the fiscal crisis, um, 
Of course, uh, I do not expect uh, any sustained current account deficit, uh, which is different from Mr. Shirakawa. But uh, uh, even if uh, you know Mr. Shirakawa is right, I mean uh, we would have uh, some uh, small sustained uh, current account deficit for some time. I think uh, uh, we need a kind of a visible capital flight from Japan to create a fiscal crisis in Japan. I think. Uh, as you know, uh, Japan's government, de government debt is almost 100% denominated in Japanese yen. And uh, so uh, it's not being affected, it would not be affected by the rating change. So uh, I think uh, uh, it is, the key it would be a behavior of a domestic uh, people. Uh, so um, if people's uh, behavior of bringing their assets outside Japan would be gradual, uh, we would be the risk of fiscal crisis should be very limited. If suddenly they accelerate uh, their diversification of assets outside Japan, that would create more more tension in JGB market. Even even uh, if BOJ continue to purchase a lot of JGB from the market. Yep. Uh, on the second point that the uh, related to the uh, overseas uh, production. Um, we are now hearing that the uh, uh, many companies, I mean, large manufacturers, are you know, thinking that current 100 to 105 level of the yen against the US dollar makes the uh, 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 operating rate or in production in Japan is rising a little bit and uh, uh, not reducing, but just when the increase of the demand is coming, where do you put the uh, place to produce? Many companies now thinking to sort of more focus on the domestic rather than overseas. That's probably happening already. And, but I don't think that the, uh, the trend of Japanese companies to uh, shift their, their capacity to, uh, to emerging economies where the demand is increasing much faster than developed economies, that trend is probably not changing too much. That means, uh, to some extent, the uh, currency makes the, uh, uh, some behavioral shift of the co corporate. But the more longer term story, I still think that the uh, demographics, energy policy, uh, that's kind of a, a headwinds for the uh, manufacturing in this country makes the overseas capacity uh, more um, uh, rising faster than the domestic ones. So th that's what I think about the uh, uh, first, I mean, first part of the second question. And on the fiscal side, I don't think the fiscal crisis will come in, in the next couple of years. That's very unlikely. And even the current account turned to deficit in, say, a couple of months or years, I still believe this Japan's holding of three trillion US dollar equivalent of the foreign asset makes the people feel, hey, the time is not now yet. And so it takes quite a long time to feel that Japanese domestic people feel we have to, uh, you know, flight our capital to the overseas. But, you know, it's just an issue of the timing. Uh, by 2020, I mean, as you know, the 2020 we have an Olympic Games in Tokyo, so that's a very good target year for the whole Japanese. So I think to, until 2020, society or country as a whole probably can so hold up. But after that, still very scary. That's what I'm, my view is on that. Thank you. Nazari, Panorit News. I would like Mr. Shigawa to elaborate more about what you said that the energy policy and energy prices are the main uh, threat or main risk for the Japanese economy. Do you have some more details, especially what which is the best uh, price for the oil uh, barrel for Japan? And I have uh, one uh, simple question for any of you: uh, How how is the Chinese uh, crisis with Japan is affecting Japanese economy, if any? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, regarding the price of oils, uh, from Japanese viewpoint, uh, simply put, the cheaper the better. <laughs> of course, uh, if it's uh, cheap excessively, of course, that would affect the, the growth rate of uh, uh, resource-producing countries, which would affect our exports. So, of course, uh, any wild uh, fluctuation would not be desirable. But, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, $80 per barrel is much better than 100 110 and uh, uh, usually, you know, 10% rise in uh, energy prices uh, would subtract about uh, 0 0.5, 0.66% of Japanese GDP. So uh, it's very, very important. So uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, probably I, I hope uh, oil prices would be stabilizing uh, at around somewhere at least between 100 and 110. 
uh, if the oil prices rises above 120 or 130 and and stay there, of course, uh, I, I need to think about uh, the growth prospect for Japan for this year. And uh, regarding energy policy, it's a very delicate matter. So uh, it's very difficult to tell what Japan should do. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, uh, we need to get some consensus among people on this. And uh, probably 2014 would be the year in which uh, Japanese people would seek for uh, the, the some, some direction for long-term energy policy. And in that context, I think, uh, of course, uh, many people in, in the market are watching very carefully the result of the election in Tokyo metropolitan area. Thank you very much. Uh, Chinese? China. Chinese, yeah, China. that's right, China. China. And if, any, if anyone yeah. has a, on what's, yeah. what's happening in China and how it will affect Japan this year. I think the now China is, I mean, uh, the, the policy makers in China is now shifting to the uh, more sort of policy driven uh, soft landing scenario. And I think that's working quite well so far. And uh, we, many uh, Western uh, people all, uh, often argue that the China is now near collapse or something. But I think that's not the case. And uh, we think that soft landing is quite possible. But uh, in case something terrible, more politically speaking, something happening, you know, it's very scary for us, as you probably understand. The history always tells that the uh, something happening in the domestic, always the policy, I mean, leaders of the country try to, how do you say, uh, mispl uh, how do you say, they, this, uh, uh, they try to focus the uh, issue to the external side. And uh, obviously, uh, as you understand, that the, when some external issues should be raised in from China's perspective, which countries would be a more you know, target? Our, our country is, I think. So uh, that's uh, always a concern for us. Anyone else on China have anything to add? Yeah. yeah um, well, the, we have two economies uh, which have not yet um, tried, tried to you know, recapitalize banking industry um, after probably experiencing the massive credit and investment boom. Uh, these two economies are China and Europe. Japan's case is 97, 98. US case is seven, 2007, 2008. Two economies, in, in, in my view, um, you know, anyway, were forced to react to a banking system instability after the investment booms. But the China and Europe, in my understanding, those two economies also experienced investment booms, but not yet. Uh, you know, have seen any major changes in terms of the banking system policy. Europe is now making some progress, but not necessarily in China in our understanding. So in that sense, we have to be a bit careful. It is kind of risk scenario, it's not kind of base case scenario for us, but we have to be very careful, uh, you know, in, in terms of development of China, uh, you know, in the banking system in particular, in, in, in that sense. Thanks very much. Uh, anyone else from the working press? Hi, my name is Eleanor Warnock and I work for the Wall Street Journal. I wanted to ask something that has a little bit to do with the uh, current account question, which is about Japan's trade balance. And I know today that Japan saw another huge trade deficit in November. I wanted to ask if um, how much of that is actually due to the energy problem, the rising energy imports, and how much of that is due to kind of a structural change in Japan's uh, trade balance. So if you could answer that question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's 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 very difficult to kind of quantify um, and make you know uh, make breakdown uh, of what is happening in trade balance. But uh, the um, two things I would like to point: number one, uh, imports to GDP or imports to domestic demand, uh, which is so-called import penetration, uh, has been on the rise. Uh, on a secular basis. It suggests that uh, even under remaining sluggish exports, 
Japanese imports tend to increase. And that means uh, probably because of the um, pouring out the production outsourcing, uh, Japanese companies have been forced to import parts and materials kind of thing. This is a structural thing. And second point I'd like to make uh, is that the, in terms of the reaction of prices to the yen's depreciation, um, you know, imports, import prices have been somewhat more sensitive to yen's depreciation rather than export prices. But Japanese companies have been doing so, so well in terms of changing their price tags in, in the yen terms. So means probably the current, you know, the uh, deterioration of the balance uh, to a large extent rely on change in Japanese trade structure rather than price setting. And maybe Kichikawa-san would have a view on the energy imports. And energy imports have had an impact on imports itself. But in the meantime, I, I tend to feel that structural change uh, seems to be more important. That's why we are expecting current account balance getting into a structural deficit uh, even within 12, 15 months' time. Uh, even under yen's depreciation, mainly because of this structural change in trade. And of course, you know, the energy policy, if it changes, may affect the trade balance on the positive side, but the, in terms of magnitude, uh, may, may not be enough to change the course. So uh, I'm fairly pessimistic in that sense. That this is mainly because of you know, the change in you know, supply chain, trade, trade structure. Thank you. And anyone else have anything well, to yeah. add, contest? Uh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, in terms of data, uh, actually, uh, compared with 2010, uh, when Japan had a trade surplus of about 8 trillion yen. Uh, this year, we are likely to have 11, probably, 11 trillion yen trade deficit. So this is about uh, 18, 19 trillion yen deterioration of Japan trade balance. And uh, this 18, 19 trillion yen deterioration of trade balance could be divided probably mostly even, evenly between the energy factor and the non-energy factor. A little bit larger, uh, energy factor is it's a little larger than non-energy non factor. Probably 10 trillion yen would be energy. Uh, eight to nine should be related with non-energy uh, areas. And uh, out of this 10 trillion yen uh, deterioration of energy trade, probably two thirds would be related to prices. One third would be a kind of a uh, more real change uh, related to the composition of source of energy after the earthquake in 2011. This is a kind of rough. Uh, kind of a description of how Japan's trade balance deteriorated over the past three years. Um, regarding the near-term prospect for Japan's trade and current account uh, balance, uh, yeah, I need to admit that uh, uh, imports are growing faster than I originally expected, yeah, honestly speaking. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's possible for Japan to continue to have current account deficit until uh, probably third quarter of this year, uh, in my view, uh, because uh, if we look at current account or trade balance from uh, a viewpoint of balance between investment and saving, I think uh, this year, uh, corporate sector is likely to increase the investment, which means that uh, uh, investment saving balance of corporate sector would not increase savings. And uh, uh, the same can be said about household sector. Um, because of the higher consumer tax rates, they would be forced to s reduce some saving to sustain the level of spending. And the uh, big question would be, what will happen to the government balance? But uh, at least this year, at least past half of this year, Japanese government deficit would not improve very much because the uh, government would continue to try to stimulate the economy from fiscal side. So uh, all these three main sectors would not see an improvement in their investment saving balance, uh, at least for the two to three quarters to come. So uh, it is possible for us to, for, for Japan to continue to have current account deficits for some time. But after that, in my view, at least temporarily, we should see a very visible improvement in government investment saving balance as a result of two things. One is, of course, higher consumption tax rate. And the second is a much better tax revenue and while long-term interest would be continue to be depressed by the BOJ. 
this situation would continue at least for two years. So uh, I think uh, 2015, 2016 would be the year when people would be at least temporarily surprised by the improvement in the government balance of Japan. So uh, during the, during the uh, process, uh, I think uh, Japan would restore some small current account surplus. Thank you. Um, working press folks first. Uh, ah, I see Daniel over there. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe my pointing was uh, not clear, but ne next, next. <laughs> One, two, yeah. Next. Daniel Leusink, Het Financiële Dagblad, the financial paper from Holland. Um, I missed the presentation, so my apologies if any of the speakers already touched upon my question. I'll hit you with the gavel if they have. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, one of the first things that government did last year was move the uh, special reconstruction budget to the special accounts. Um, and I'm not an expert on this at all. So what's the role of this special account? And secondly, to what extent do you think that the reconstruction of Tohoku can become a motor for economic growth and for abenomics? Thank you. Anyone want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, first point on the special account, I mean, this is a Japanese uh, central government's uh, budget uh, scheme that I don't know, we, we always focus on the general account. That's for all, or nearly all uh, uh, key, key spending and revenue of the central government. But uh, uh, for the special purposes, uh, government set up the special account. And uh, in 2011, uh, after the uh, Tohoku disaster, government uh, sort of decided to separate this account because this special, I mean, this uh, reconstruction of the Tohoku region is a very different uh, idea of uh, from a central government's general account. So that's a more, so, you know, technical of uh, accounting issues. And uh, last year, uh, government, uh, so um, it's a little bit tricky, uh, technical issue, so I don't want to dig in too much, but point is, uh, from the macroeconomic perspective, it doesn't matter whether reconstruction is happening in Tohoku or uh, public investment in Tokyo or Okinawa is happening. That's all the same for us, that all public investment increase, that makes the GDP growth higher. And the government is now, uh, of course, trying to uh, reconstruct the Tohoku region as soon as possible, but uh, there are many issues uh, related to the uh, uh, consensus view on how people uh, sort of reconstruct the towns and the cities. So the procedures are a little bit delayed, and that makes it very difficult for the government to uh, pursue the uh, reconstruction activity over there. But at the same time, uh, from macroeconomic policy uh, as a fiscal policy, a government need to spur the, uh, I mean, to stimulate the economy. So uh, they are more focusing on the investment, uh, not only the, uh, the Tohoku regions, but also all of the country. And now we are more and more uh, stories hearing about the uh, investment in Tokyo for the uh, preparation of the Olympic Games in 2020. Pro uh, I'm not probably exactly answering your questions, but uh, that's what's uh, happening, I think. Anyone have anything to add on Tohoku? Well, um, spending to reconstruct Tohoku area is making our work very difficult because uh, the timing of raising money by the government and uh, actually spending is very different. So uh, it's very di it, it's, it is making very difficult for us to estimate the real level of spending by the government. Uh, that is a kind of a, the one of the reasons why uh, macro researchers' views on the government policies effect are so divided for this year. And uh, my view is that uh, uh, judging from the recent data by the government, uh, spending to reconstruct the, 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 the Tohoku area is being to some extent delayed. So the timing of spending is now pushing forward. I mean, pushing, I'm sorry, delayed to in, the, in the future point. So uh, I think uh, this year uh, we could see, uh, feel some support of the increase in spending in that area because of, actually money was raised in the past years, but uh, spending would be made this year. So that would be uh, uh, making the government uh, fiscal policy a little bit more st uh, stimulative uh, to the growth this year, maybe. Thank you. Uh, 
、工房稲村アソシエト。It's not 100% satisfactory, but、uh, I, I, I could listen to your opinions that Abenomics was、uh, successful. At least、uh, the first arrow and the second arrow, which, was,、uh, which were against the、uh, conventional usual preaching of the economists and somebody else. But、uh, while listening to your、uh, comments about the th third arrow,、uh, is it all right to maintain the structural reforms that w a s、uh, usually said that if it lacks,、uh, it、uh, uh, breaks the economic growth, etc.? My impression for the past decade's ex experience is that,、uh, that economic、uh, structural reforms should be、uh, discarded. What do you think? That's an interesting question.、Uh, you've all spoken out in favor of structural reforms and, and if anything, critical of the、uh, inadequacy of the third arrow so far. But what about this?、Uh, Counter proposition that structural reforms might, for example, be deflationary. Might,、uh, I mean, you know, some,、um, certainly that's、uh, a view of perhaps a minority, but not,、uh, it's not that rare in Japan.、Um, yeah, I think、um, the very important point for Japan is from the perspectives of the、um, you know, government debt sustainability, which is a really important issue for Japan. As Kichikawa san、uh, clearly mentioned, that the most important variable for Japan is nominal GDP. So, what does matter is nominal GDP, and in terms of the combination, you can choose.、Um, a very extreme case of, for Japan is the real GDP declining by 1%, but 5% inflation and 4% nominal GDP. What, what about that? Do you like that? Well, you don't like that, the point. So, Third a r of economics and, and potential GDP growth enhancing measures, I think the key point is why don't we achieve 1% real, 2% inflation, 3% nominal? It's very good, rather than minus 1 and plus 4.、Um, so the, that's kind of a tricky thing, mainly because, as, as I mentioned, the,、uh, what is the combination between you know, the inflation and real GDP? And if structural reforms are so, so powerful, deregulations are really powerful, we're going to see a pickup in real GDP growth rate, but in the meantime, we're going to see a decline in prices, possibly. So, 3% real and minus 1% prices and plus 2% nominal. But I think the point is this is kind of the very much arithmetic and it's a very kind of conceptual thing. In reality, I do not think real GDP is picking up to 2% level. Potential would be really, let's say, like 0.5 maximum, even under massive deregulation.、Uh, because you know, our view on trend GDP is minus 0.5, actually, so,、uh, because of the decline in population. And the point is, Japan is now suffering the aging population, shrinking working age population, plus. Uh, the aging capital stock. So, infrastructure is now aging. So, the quality effects from there would be there. So, minus 0.5, we know we're looking for. So, I think the, even though I said Sadalo、um, is, is gathering some momentum, we tend to think that potential GDP cannot be exceeding 0.5. So,、uh, we need, in our calculation,、uh, 4% inflation. To get Japan's debt to GDP converging to some 200% level over the medium run. So, what we're looking for is plus 0.5% real GDP if Abenomics is successful on Sadala and 4% inflation, 4.5% nominal GDP. That is needed for, the, for this country. You know,、um, that may be you know, having the significant impact on the lower income people. But that is needed in our view. So, there's our, our, you know, the、uh, potential GDP and trend nominal GDP kind of arguments. Anyone else? Why, why,、uh... Well, I feel some sympathy about the cautiousness of deflationary aspect of、uh, kind of growth strategy. But、uh, so, I think sequence of policies、uh, would be very important. So,、uh, only after getting out of deflation. After confirming we have get,、uh, got, gotten out of deflation, we should begin. We should, we should begin the real effort to, to deregulate the economy. But the still, all about the long term, I think、uh, uh, growth strategy is important. Because、uh, 
we are facing uh, two things. One is, of course, uh, uh, long-lasting gentle deflation, uh, which kept real interest rates very high in Japan, which depressed uh, investment by the corporate sector. Uh, but the now we are changing it. After that, of course, uh, uh, it is very important to sustain the productivity growth. And uh, so uh, as shiraka san commented, uh, of course, uh, we need to create an environment in which a business sector are willing to invest in productive capital assets. So uh, uh, that requires several things. One is, of course, uh, some change in tax policy. And another would be a deregulation uh, and a more quality of the government policy uh, for, for, for the medium term. These things are very important uh, to sustain the productivity growth uh, over the medium term. Productivity growth is the only source of the, the real growth of people's income. So uh, I think uh, efforts to sustain productivity growth by stimulating uh, business investment would be still critical. And also, uh, in order to uh, stimulate the productivity growth, probably we need to change industrial structure. We need to move the productive uh, resources, such as labor and the capital, from uh, low growth industries to high growth industries. And in order to achieve that, probably we need to increase the labor mobility inside this country. Actually, one of the characteristics, characteristics of Japanese labor market is very low labor mobility. So uh, uh, to do something to increase the labor mobility is critical over the medium term in order to sustain productivity growth. And, uh, of course, some industry-specific policies, such as uh, deregulation in pharmaceutical areas and agriculture areas, are also very important. So I think uh, some policies to stimulate uh, capital spending by the business sector, and uh, some policies to increase labor mobility, and the rem removal of deregulations on some industry important industries are three important things, areas of growth strategy we need to continue to pursue. Thank you. Yes, Alison. Yes. Why do we why do we need the third arrow? Yeah, um, I think the uh, what Japan lacked is the uh, expectation of not only inflation but only higher growth or higher uh, better life in the future. And I think the uh, what we need is to uh, restructure the current uh, state of the economy to make the changes. And that's why I think growth strategy, or I want to put more specifically, structural reforms are necessary in this country. And I strongly deny the argument that we can overcome the problem just by increasing inflation. I mean, inflation, yeah, from deflation to inflation is probably a good impulse of the change. But if inflation continues to say 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, can you stop it? When the BOJ should think about price stability, not the inflation per se. So I think the combination of both structural reforms and uh, aggressive easing is necessary for this country, but not just uh, uh, you know, aggressive easing of the central bank. That's uh, what my view is. Thanks. Now, uh, just actually, Shirakawa-san has to sneak out in a few minutes. But before he does, I wanted to ask something that's related to something that was in his presentation, but also linked to the last question. Uh, uh, it has to do with equality. You mentioned that one thing you'll be looking at uh, is income distribution and how that might change under Abenomics and the, and, and the forces that it's unleashed. Um, could you tell us why that might be a concern uh, and you know, why, why might, I think it was in your presentation, why might Abenomics change the distribution of income in Japan? Is it, uh, how, how serious might it get? No, I, I think the, um, the, 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 my view of here is simple. You know, this country requires much, much faster nominal GDP growth. That should require, you know, even if you do not want to, I think the high inflation. And high inflation is, is more as, I think, the, um, you know, benefiting uh, the um, wealthy, wealthy guys. And the for lower income guys, I think the VAT hike plus import inflation is kind of disaster. But that disaster situation would be needed, probably, because if the BOJ stops printing money and starts to appreciate if the deflation kicks in, and you just rely on 
such structural reforms, I don't think it's, it's the case. I think it's very much, I think, the you know, optimistic view about structural reform and those things because, you know, we need to have a much, much faster productivity growth. You know, this economy is actually you know, suffering the shrinkage of population. And I, I do not, you know, I hope that Abenomics and Sada law would be working, but in the meantime, I do not think potential GDP is really picking up much. So, you know, debt monetization and faster inflation would be the only solution. But the BOJ may not want to do that. So I think the, I think the several options, faster inflation, debt monetization, default, what? So I myself not expecting default of JGBs in, the, in, in, the, in any foreseeable future, but risk is there. Thanks. Uh, if anyone else have, has any comments, do you think Abenomics might be making Japan uh, richer in aggregate, but uh, worse off for some sectors of society? Of course, uh, you know, transitioning from deflation to inflation would have a lot of uh, kind of uh, income redistributional effects. Mm. So one is from uh, pensioners to uh, working people. One is, of course, low-income people to higher-income people with higher uh, holding of wealth. So uh, these are kind of two major uh, things uh, which are happening and uh, of course, we need to do something to cushion uh, the impact on the uh, people who would suffer from this kind of redistributional effect. But still, uh, it is very important for us to transition from deflation to inflation because uh, deflation is very, very costly for, for Japanese economy. So, uh, so uh, probably uh, first priority should be to transition from deflation to inflation. And probably we should respond with other policies to cushion the impact on people who would suffer. That would be a kind of a right way of thinking about this. Thanks. If you don't have anything to add? All right. Michael? Sorry. Ah, I think Shirokawa Can we just give a quick round of applause to Shirokawa Sanderson? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Penn of the Shingetsu News Agency. Uh, we haven't heard the word TPP yeah, yet in this presentation, uh, and it's obviously a big topic for journalists. Um, I guess two related questions. First of all, uh, how important is it that the agreement does get signed? It, obviously, the Abe administration is putting a lot of political capital into this, uh, this agreement. And from what you have heard so far, uh, how is the agreement shaping up? Is it what Japan is looking for? Is it what Japan needs? Or are you getting concerns about what you're hearing about some parts of the agreement? And in particular, of course, you mentioned briefly the agricultural sector. What's the outlook there uh, for the Japanese uh, growth? Well, of course, uh, it's too early to tell uh, what the implication uh, the TPP would have on Japanese economy because we we, we don't know yet the, the final result of the negotiation. So uh, it's, it's still kind of a, so I can make only pre pre preliminary comments on, on your question. But uh, I think uh, TPP is important uh, for Japan in two senses. One is, of course, uh, political reasons. Uh, as you know, uh, Japan often needs gaiatsu, pressure from outside to overcome the resistance to the, to the kind of a deregulation type of things, uh, which would face a very strong uh, resistance from uh, kind of uh, lobbying parties. So uh, I think uh, TPP could be utilized as a way uh, to overcome the resistance uh, inside Japan uh, to, 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 to deregulate this economy especially in some important areas, including pharmaceuticals and, uh, and the agricultural <laughs> sectors. And uh, another aspect is uh, TPP could create the kind of opportunities for Japan, especially, uh, I think, uh, for example, think about Japanese food. Um, I often visit US and European countries, and uh, of course, uh, especially last year or in 2012, I asked them whether Japanization was taking place in Europe or US. And many people smiling answered to me that, uh, well, we are Japanizing in terms of food, but uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, financial markets or real economy, probably we are not yet uh, Japanize, Japanize, experiencing Japanization. And so in, in that way, Japanese food is very, very getting popular 
uh, all over the world. So uh, TPP create uh, kind of opportunities for us, for example, uh, for us to, uh, to export more foods or kind of a culture related with foods to other countries. So uh, there are two aspects of TPP for us. Uh, regarding agriculture, that should be a very long-term process. I think uh, still it's very delicate, politically delicate matter inside Japan. So uh, I think, uh, I don't think uh, that would be, the problem would be solved within one to two years. But uh, as you know, uh, agriculture industry accounts for only 1% of GDP of this country. I think uh, this is too small, uh, given the some competitiveness uh, Japan's agricultural industry has. So uh, by removing some regulation uh, on, on that industry, prob probably we would be able to double the size of agriculture industries but in, in, say, 10 years. So if we could, uh, the por weight of agriculture industry from 1% to 2% in 10 years, that would raise Japan trend growth by 0.1%, which is very important. So uh, I think uh, uh, probably gradually deregulating and spur the growth of agriculture industries is uh, one of the hopeful areas for us to, to, in which we can raise uh, potential growth rate of Japan. Thanks. I just don't have anything to add. Yeah, yeah well, just a brief comment. I mean, if we fail TPP, that's you know, disaster for this political situation and in, on the also growth prospects. So uh, I hope it works. But the problem is probably not only Japan. You know, TPP is the negotiation of the, what, six and 12? How many countries? I forgot, sorry. You know, more than 10. So, uh, and as you know, that the, you used to hear that the negotiation would have some kind of conclusion by end of the last year, but it didn't because of the rather US side rather than Japan side. So I think the uh, uh, TPP is very critical for not only Japan, but for the aging or global economy. That's what I strongly believe. Would it be a disaster for symbolic reasons or f because of the actual concrete benefits that would have come out of it? I put the symbolic is more important at, at this moment, but concrete will follow, I think. Thank you. Any other questions? We're now open to the whole room. Yeah. One and two. Yeah. Siegfried Needle, freelancer from Germany. Uh, a follow-up to the question about productivity. Uh, I think um, the gov our government wants to make a kind of labor market reform, and this could be could lead to a higher productivity. But um, mostly, also, it leads to lower wages, and because perhaps it means uh, to it will lead to uh, a higher number of uh, irregular workers, and um, and what I think this means. Uh, the, the, the necessary high, higher uh, income for to overcoming the deflation will not. It's difficult to achieve with a kind with this kind of market reform. So how how is a higher productivity? Can is it related to um, um, overcoming deflation because the income is mm -hmm. perhaps is shrinking? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Addison, I think the. Uh, quite important point of the higher productivity and uh, uh, price dynamics is uh, expectation of higher growth in the future. You know, the last 20 years, many academics argue that why Japan has been deflation, is that because of the BOJ policy? No, it's not, because it's continuous lower expectation of growth. So lower expectation of growth made the potential growth lower because of the less investment <coughs> and less innovations. So. You can argue uh, in reverse that if you can sort of increase the expectation of the growth at the same time the increasing a potential growth rate, that makes the, you know, you can achieve both mild inflation and higher potential growth rate. So uh, I think the, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned about labor market reforms. So, and uh, you say that the uh, uh, labor market reforms make a lower wages. Yes. It may make a lower wages relative to without, uh, without uh, uh, reforms. But if you combine with the uh, very aggressive monetary easing and uh, right reforms, you can raise the wages in the long-term trend. 
So I think the, uh, uh, it's always a, a, a combination of the policy that make overcome the problems. Probably it's not, it's not a good idea to just focus on the one issue, but you should focus on the comprehensive uh, uh, prospects of the uh, growth dynamics. Thanks. Kichikawa-san, you suggested in your uh, initial presentation that you think Japan's shrinking population and shrinking labor force might soon become an inflationary mm -hmm. Uh, factor. Do you, mm -hmm. you want to expand on that as well as well as directly to the question? Yeah, actually, first, uh, actually, shrinking population, shrinking working population has two aspects. One is, of course, that is decreasing the demand, but uh, at the same time, that is reducing the supply capacity. So, which effect would be stronger is a big question. And uh, actually, the conclusion would be purported in the fluctuation in unemployment rate. Uh, the actual denominator of the unemployment rate is a uh, working population. So that is that's uh, kind of a symbolized a supply factor, and the nomina nomination nominator uh, actually the, the which was divided by the working population is uh, is a, is a kind of a fluctuating the the reflecting demand side. So uh, if unemployment rates goes below some threshold line, which means that uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, supply factor would be becoming much stronger than demand factor. So uh, uh, I'm say what I'm saying is that uh, if unemployment rates uh, declined to, say, 3.7, 3.6%, that would mean that uh, finally uh, shrinking population would become more inflationary rather than deflationary. Essentially because it's going to push up wages faster than consumption would. Well, actually, uh, yeah, actually uh, by making more difficult for companies to hire new people, that would put some uh, upward pressure on wages. Actually, if we adjust uh, wages for working hours, we have already begun seeing some visible rise in uh, hourly wages, year on year basis. All right, thank you. We have time for one, maybe two more questions, depending on how complex they are. Uh, actually, you haven't asked, asked a question yet, and then I'll get back to you, Andy. Hmm? Oh, wait one second, yeah, go ahead first, yeah. Okay, sometimes my bosses in Europe, and maybe also Jonathan's, are more impressed than me about uh, uh, political tensions uh, re related to territorial issues. Yeah, so jet uh, fighter scrambling and uh, uh, verbal exchanges and so on. So to what extent do you think there could possibly uh, be economic consequences of these uh, economic tensions? Uh, and I mean, these political tensions? Uh, between China and Japan and even Korea. Thanks. Yeah, we talked about China's economy, but what about, what about that aspect of the China? Japan well, um, exports to China accounts for about 20% of Japan's total exports. And uh, usually when tension, political tension between China and Japan intensifies, uh, some specific type of goods are affected, such as automobiles and the home appliances. And that kind of part of goods or services accounts for about 15% of Japan's exports to China. So 15% of the 20%. Yeah, so when Noda administration uh, nationalizes Senkaku Island in August 2012, actually Japan's exports of automobiles to China halved within a few months. And also our exports of home appliances, which could be recognized as Japanese made in Japan goods, uh, also halved. And so if 15% portion of exports from Japan to China halved suddenly, that would reduce Japan's exports to China by 7.5%. And since uh, China's ex exports to China accounts for 20% of total exports to Japan, that would reduce Japan's exports by 1.5%. And exports account for about 20% of Japan's GDP. So uh, it's about uh, 0 0.2, 0 point, sorry. It's about 0.2, 0 0.23% uh, impact on Japanese GDP. So uh, if, tension intensifies, and if that will lead to a kind of boycott of Japanese goods by the Chinese consumers, that would be uh, pose a risk of uh, 20 basis, 30 basis, 40 basis reduction of by gross exports. This is all we can say at this point. Beyond that, of course, no one knows, actually. Thanks. Anything to add? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the past numbers, probably that's kind of a uh, calculations you can make. But as you probably your interest is more sort of, you know, more wider uh, implication for the, uh, in a, in including sentiment and confidence. And I think, you know, this conflict with China for Japan is very 
uh, miserable for both country and for whole region as well. And uh, I think that's a, a, a part of the uh, Abe, uh, Abe's administration that they should be more concerned, I think. And, but uh, uh, politics is not the, uh, our special sort of, you know, strength. I mean, economists tend to ignore the uh, politics. So uh, I, I'm sorry, but I, I, only things I can mention is that the, uh, our baseline scenario doesn't expect the attention will be heightened this year. All right, I think we have uh, time for one more question. Anthony, you had your hand up, so. A quick question to taper off the debate about tapering. Um, it's going fairly smoothly, apparently, in the US so far, although I, I emphasize so far. But when the time comes for Japan, the Bank of Japan, to taper, I mean, it's so big in relation to GDP, what do you think the impact on the economy and the monetary system is going to be? Yes, thanks. Probably takes us beyond 2014, but a great great way yeah. to end is to look, yeah. look even further down. I think the one thing I want to stress at this moment is, as you know, that BOJ is avoiding to talk about the exit policy. And because they think that this is too early. But in my view, they have to start talking about it. And I think the potential uh, damage by the BOJ's failure to exit from this current QQE policy is devastating. And I don't think that will happen in the next uh, couple of years. But uh, before 2020, that may be possible. So. Uh, uh, you know, what the BOJ is now doing is to, to learning from what the Fed is doing. And uh, I think when the time comes, the BOJ and government, I mean, that means fiscal policy, should be combined quite well, I mean, coordinated quite well to exit this policy. And, uh, uh, but uh, at the moment, personally, I'm very concerned. Well, yeah, I fully agree with uh, Adachi-san about the importance of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy uh, in the process of exiting from QQE. Uh, but um, uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, because uh, as in the case of the Federal Reserve this time, I think, uh, you know, when the banking system begins to function well, that would be a time for the central bank to exit from this kind of uh, unconventional quantitative easing policy. Because uh, quantitative easing policy is a policy uh, in which uh, central bank utilizes its asset side of balance sheet very actively. Uh, because the uh, banking sector is not functioning. So uh, uh, changing reserve conditions would not work to change the monetary condition inside the economy. So uh, uh, central banks are forced to uh, try to uh, impact the, the long-term bond and the mortgage bond market directly by increasing the asset holdings. But uh, this is because the uh, banking sector is not working. So uh, if banking sector begins to work, probably uh, central bank should be and could be uh, changing the policy from the unconventional side to co more conventional side. But uh, of course, in the transition period, we should see some wild fluctuation in long-term interest rates. So that would be inevitable, but uh, uh, that would not destroy the economy, in my view. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, all three of our speakers, including uh, the one who snuck out. And uh, if you give them a big round of applause. Uh, I'll keep uh, Shirakawa-san's membership for later and give it to him later. But uh, as usual, we have a uh, honorary oh, membership in the club uh, that lasts, I think, a year. Thank uh, you. Please come and use it and have a drink with us another time. Thanks very much. Thank you.